There are many impediments and hindrances when it comes to starting your own business, and employment is one of them. Our first guest tonight knew that very well, but it did not deter her to take her move into business. So join me as we talk to her and she explains to us her journey into entrepreneurship. Welcome, this is The Entrepreneur. My name is Paul K. Mwaora. My name is Wandia Gishuru. Um, I'm a Kenyan woman, um, a mother, uh, and recently a businesswoman. Um, I started a company almost four years ago called Vivo. Uh, the official name is Vivo Activewear, uh, but our brand is just known as Vivo. And we're a ladies' uh, clothing line that um, has currently has five retail shops, four in Nairobi, one in Mombasa, and we're opening our sixth shop in, hopefully in March of this year, in the new mall on Thika Road called Garden City. Uh, and we, we manufacture and sell clothes that are geared towards the modern, professional Kenyan woman. Before you started this business, what were you doing before and where were you? Before uh, going into business, I was an international development advisor. Um, and the last 10 years before starting Vivo, I was working for the British government um, in four different countries, advising on their development programs. Yeah. You have worked you know, in you know, high-profile jobs you know, in different organizations. What made you quit? You know, I'd been employed for about 20 years, um, and it had been fantastic. I mean, a lot of great experiences, decent money, um, you know, working with really good teams of people. Uh, but I think, like many people, I got to the point where I was like, I want to do something for myself. I want to feel what it's like to actually start something from scratch um, and be fully responsible. Because I think what happens when you're employed, you're just one out of a team of many and you, you may not be the main decision maker, you may not be, the buck doesn't always stop with you. Um, so I wanted that and I also wanted the freedom. I wanted the freedom to set my own schedule, to decide you know, how many days of the week I want to work, uh, what sort of hours, uh, to cater to, to a lifestyle um, that looked at the broader perspective. Yeah. In your 20 years of working, how long did you have that idea? How long did you have that idea you know, to start business and when did you start? You know what's interesting, it's not something that I had thought about that often. Um, but ever since I was quite young, my father always used to tell me, you know, one day you'd be good at business. And I was like, why? I mean, why do you think that? He was just, you, want, you would be good at business. And I think that was always in the back of my head somewhere, even though I didn't understand where that came from. Um, and then I think towards the end of my last uh, job, I knew that my contract was ending and so it, I had to make a decision. Do I want to carry on doing the same thing? And you know, I wasn't getting any younger. Um, so I just thought, well, it's now or never. I mean, if I'm gonna, I've been, you know, wanting a change. Um, I, I, I was fortunate in that um, the jobs that I'd had were, were quite well paying. So I'd actually managed to save some money. Um, so I was like, you know, I've got a bit of money saved. Now's the time. Um, so basically, I would say probably in the last year before I left employment is when I started thinking about seriously going into business. Probably invested about five million shillings. And what kind of uh, ladies wear do you get to make? Where is your niche? Women's clothing at the moment. We haven't introduced a men's wear line yet. Uh, and our products, well, one of the things that, that sort of um, influences the, the, the style of clothing that we make is we don't believe that women need to sacrifice comfort for style. We think that you can be very stylish, very presentable, whether be it at work or at a function in the evenings or at church or at a wedding, and still be very comfortable, you know? You worked for quite some time. Now, the 20 years you said you worked, you know, you're in employment, and now you get into business. How was that transition and how did it work for you? How did you manage it? I think the biggest adjustment is that you, 
you're not really that accountable to anybody, so you need to be a lot more disciplined. Um, you know, it's easy when you have a boss who's there waiting to see if you're going to show up or not. When you're, when you're self-employed, um, you know, it's really up to you. So for me, that adjustment of, you know, making sure every day that I'm still uh, putting the time in, putting the effort in, although I must say it wasn't that hard because I enjoy what I do. Now you're in business, um, what challenges have you faced and how are you tackling them? I think the biggest challenge is that I didn't have much expertise or background in the areas, you know, either in retail, in marketing, in design, in production. I mean, all of these areas were new for me, so that's been a huge challenge to try and, you know, come up the learning curve. Um, so the ways in which I've tried to to overcome that challenge is by, by self teaching. I mean, I read a lot. There's so much on the internet and, you know, so much that you can pick up, talking to people, asking for advice, and then hiring the right people who can come with that sort of expertise, either as full-time employees, but also as consultants. So this is our production room okay. uh, where the tailors sit and also where we do all the cutting of the fabric. Where do you get to source your raw materials from? So the materials we bring from Asia um, because the kind of fabric we use is all, a lot of it is very stretchy, it has lycra and, and um, spandex, so none of that is manufactured locally. Um, so we have to import it and if we imported it, most of it is made in Asia, even if you go and buy it in Europe what you're buying is actually been made in Asia. So how many people have you employed so far? As of wow. now, we're about 35 uh, people in the whole company. So that includes the sales team that, are, that sit in the shops and also the, the production team, the designers, the cutters, the tailors, the ladies who do the quality control. And then we also have management and administration as well. These are definitely products that you need to showcase and you know tell people about. How do you get to market yourself? Do quite a lot on social media. Um, so we have an Instagram page. We have we're on Twitter. We have a Facebook page. I think on Facebook we have almost 22,000 fans on our page. Um, Instagram is a lot less, but we, that's growing. And then we we do um, bulk SMSs when we have special promotions or if there's new stock, new collections. And then we take opportunities when, when we can, um, if there's a, a chance to sponsor an event, uh, if we can get any sort of coverage in the media, we'll, we'll, we'll take, a, take those opportunities. Why would somebody come back to a Vigo store or even if there's somebody else to yeah. this I think buy I, a garment? Uh, the kind of clothing that we have is very day-to-day-to-day -to -day -to -day wear. You know, it's not, it's not necessarily something you would wear to a red carpet event. Um, but if, you know, that we have a lot of basic items um, and we offer them in different colors and different fabrics. So I think once you've bought at Vivo and you realize, one, that our pricing is not too high, I think we're quite reasonably priced. Um, and you, you see how versatile the clothing is. You know, you'll buy something and take it home and find yourself wearing it every week, you know, you're like, oh, maybe I should get some more. So a lot of our clients are repeat clients. We have a loyalty program that we offer um, to everybody. So you win award points every time you buy and then you can redeem that. And the, the, the database of people in our, our loyalty program is now in the thousands. We have probably about 5,000 people and that's growing all the time. Advising those who have that eye on fashion, she delves into the prerequisites. First of all, I would say if you, if you have an urge, if there's this idea or this you know, um, thought inside you that's saying you want to, to try and do something in this area, then you must start somewhere. You know? And there's many, many different ways you can start. I mean, I don't think there's one road to success. So even if it's like, let me just find a little fundi somewhere, I can be just buying a few pieces of fabric every month and taking it to him and trying to come up with some interesting designs, showing them to my friends or even making them for myself, 
that's starting. I think my biggest advice is just find a way to put your foot in the door um, and start something. Don't just let it remain an idea in your head. Let's get personal here now. Now, when you're out of work, you know, when you're not in the office, when you're not in this uh, place that you're in your business place, what do you love doing at your free time? And what I hope is if you have Amy. I love to laugh. You know, so I love being around friends, around my children, when they're being silly, when they're just, you know, uh, not taking life too seriously. I think, you know, we take things so seriously at work and, 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 and there can be a lot of fun as well. But I think when I'm outside of work, I just want to have fun, relax. I love music. I love dancing. Um, and I, ha I follow certain people, you know, whose lives I admire and their way of looking at the world. I'm hoping you enjoyed the show that we had tonight and the guests that we brought for you. Now, what do you want to see in your life? Draw what you want and then cut through to that life that you want. Do not procrastinate. We're taking a short commercial break, but when we return, we have another guest for you. So don't go away because we have something that we want you to watch. I want you to get in touch with us on our social media pages that are on your screen right now, Facebook, Twitter, and even our email address. Keep those tweets coming. And thank you for keeping it, KTN. Thank you for those watching us around the country, Kisumu, Mombasa, wherever you are watching us from. We thank you for keeping it, KTN. Even those in the diaspora watching us via live stream. Keep it, KTN. <laughs> Welcome back to the show. If you are joining us, we're in the second segment of The Entrepreneur. Thank you for keeping it KTN. Kenya is endowed with lots of raw materials and services. And our second guest tonight has taken advantage of that and started a business that is helping her way around. So join me as we talk to her and learn more of what she's doing. You can start by introducing yourself to us. Let us know who you are and what you do. My name is Chebet Mutai. I run and own a company called Wazawazi. Wazawazi means waza, which is to think in Kiswahili and wazi is to open. So Wazawazi is about an open-minded outlook to life. So the name Wazawazi, what does it mean? Wazawazi is a company that produces high quality, high-end leather products. So the company started with bags, but is slowly diversifying into more leather products beyond bags and luggage, furniture, and art. Basically, functional leather art. Before you started this venture, what were you doing and where were you? I started uh, Wazawazi. I was uh, working for an international development uh, organization. I have a background in development economics, so I was working for Africa, in Africa, to reduce poverty through access to finance. How long did you have that idea in mind before you started it out? So the third year in development, I started getting really disillusioned, questioning the approach of development. and thought, you know what, I can reduce poverty by creating employment in a sustainable, positive way. And um, so thought, okay, I like fashion, I like clothes, I love bags, so why not work in that space so that it is not really working, quote and quote, because if you love something, it doesn't feel like work, therefore thought of restarting the business. How much capital did you put in? So I had a very, let's say, light-headed notions about entrepreneurship. I thought, that with around half a million, I would be able to sort it all out. It turned out it needed 
way much more than that. It still does, it still, you know, uh, touch and go here, learning these mistakes are very costly. But uh, with whatever money I had, which was around half a million, I thought, let me buy machines and, and just do this, literally. I didn't think too much and I'm glad I didn't because, you know, the more you start thinking about something, first you lose momentum and then you start thinking of how it will not work. Okay. So I just jumped in, literally. And was it from your savings? Savings from my previous job. I had a few. I had little money and after a while I sold my car to put more money there. Where do you get the source for the leather that you use, you know, to make these products? Well, we have a rob uh, robust, increasingly robust leather, leather industry here. One, because the demand for leather has tripled exponentially over the last few years because we have more people consuming leather here. So we have tanneries here that produce good leather. It's good. It's not processed too much. So the, in, in most cases, the essence of what it is, without too much interference, is good enough. These are unique products proudly made in Kenya. Where can they be found? Our products are readily available at uh, the Ari shop at Villa Rosa Kempinski. That's just off uh, Waiaki Way at the African Heritage Shop. The products are readily available there. Our products are also available online and we deliver within Nairobi and we can ship. Products are available online as well. Um, www.wazawazi.co.ke as well on social media. You can find us on uh, Facebook as Wazawazi. While doing business, what challenges have you faced and how have you overcome them? We talk about challenges, we might be here all day, so I'll just keep it to three at the top of my, my head. For example, this week we've not had electricity. Right now, there's no power in the workshop and you have seen that. This is such a commonplace occurrence. We have to sort out the, the power situation because as a business owner, my costs remain the same. The industry needs its capacity to be improved so that they can even produce a better quality leather, less, less environmentally damaging um, leather and to also meet the supply because you might have to wait sometimes to get the leather. Three, um, I don't know how this would happen that then we have more local consumption. A, it's a much steadier market than, let's say, selling to foreigners. Because at the end of the day, I am African. If my product is African and consumed locally, it is better. How many people have you gotten to employ so far? So far we are six and looking to increase our team to at least 12 people. It depends. In a good week, you know, or in a, in a busy month, how many products do you get to make? In a busy week, maybe 40, if we have everything. If we have all the materials, an average of 40. Okay. We'd like to produce more. And what are the price ranges, you know, from like maybe the smallest to the biggest or from the low in price to the high in price? How much Between do they range for? Small consumer products, 4,000 leather products, 4,000, 5,000 to as much as 50,000 so far. Does she experience any competition in this market? Yes and no. Yes, there's competition because there are many other people producing good leather products. No, because our style is our style. We compete perhaps on what is our identity. Our style remains unique to us and for as long as we're not copying anyone, we have no competition in that regard. Our product is known, you go anywhere, you see our bag, you know that's our Zawazi leather bag. And that we are proud of, very proud of. What are her future plans? She explains where exactly she wants to be with her business. Our future plans, we would like to have a setup that allows us to develop high quality craftsmanship in this country to a level of you know, if I, if I say I am 
a shoemaker, you remove your hat and shake my hand and say, wow, well done. So to elevate the level of craft by training high quality crafters in the leather space, that would be ideal. And of course, to be known as an industry leader beyond our national borders. So to be in the league of extraordinary crafters in the region, in Africa, for us would be great. Talk to people watching you right now and they're probably in entrepreneurship or want to get into entrepreneurship. What advice would you give them since you are in it? It's crazy. Well, really, honestly, stick it out. Uh, have a plan, have a good idea. Don't do anything because somebody else is doing it because A, you won't be able to stick it out. You get bored somewhere along the way. It gets tiring. It's hard. So do what you love. Be the best at what you do. And buckle up because it's going to be a hard ride before it gets better in my own experience. Everyone needs motivation, Chebet narrates of hers. What motivates me is the knowledge that I am a positive influence in my own circles. At least I know that because I'm actively being positive um, in what I do and I love what I do. So that motivates me. I don't wake up to, in the morning and think, oh God, I have to go to work. I wake up and I'm like, I can't wait to get to work. So that, that, that motivates me. We've come to the end of this show. I'm hoping that you enjoyed and you were inspired and even provoked. Before we sign off, we have something for you to watch. My name is George Washiri. I am the CEO of Optimum Limited. And I'm here today to discuss with you why you should invest in property business, especially in Kenya. As you are aware that Kenya is opening up, currently we have very, very stable uh, political environment. And you can see lately there are a lot of uh, foreigners coming to Kenya to invest here. And you as a Kenyan, you are out there, you are not taking advantage of these investments. As you are aware, we have huge demand for houses in Kenya. They say that uh, in Kenya we require about 350,000 houses per year. And all developers, people like Optivin and others, they are only producing about 40,000. So there is a huge opportunity for us to invest in real estate in Kenya. Remember, the investment in Kenya is going to be better as we go forward. As you all are aware that we are currently for 4 million, and they are projecting by the year 2030, we are going to hit 67 million. So all these people require houses. They require places to call homes. So it is the right time to invest in Kenya today. Get in touch on our social media pages that are on your screen right now, Facebook, Twitter, and even our email address. Keep those tweets coming. Until next week Thursday at 8.30 p.m. here on KTN, keep it locked. It is good night, goodbye from the team and I. God bless you. I've been your presenter, Paul K. Moura.